Welcome back to another video. This is the conclusion of the Inserto series in which we talk about Skin in the Game, the last book written by Nassim Nicholas Taleb. You don't need to watch the previous videos to understand this one. We talked about asymmetry in the Black Swan and Antifragile video and now it's time to tackle symmetry. Skin in the Game is all about consequences for your actions and if you separate consequences from actions then society will rot. What Skin in the Game means is that you need to own your own risks. Whenever you are exposed to the potential upside in something, you always need to be exposed to the potential downside as well. You may never transfer the risk of the downside to someone else. If you give an opinion and someone follows it, you are morally obligated to be yourself exposed to its consequences. Or if you are in the financial markets, this can be expressed as follows. Don't tell me what you think, just tell me what's in your portfolio. Skin in the game is about bullshit detection, or to put it more nicely, avoid taking advice from someone who gives advice for a living, unless there is a penalty for their advice. We always knew that skin in the game is an important concept, because there are proverbs like an eye for an eye. Or another example is Hammurabi's code, which is almost 4000 years old. It's a set of laws that were sitting publicly in Babylon for everyone to read, or rather someone would read it to you. The most famous law is about skin in the game. If a builder builds a house and the house collapses and causes the death of the owner of the house, the builder shall be put to death. While this may be a little bit over the top, the idea makes total sense. If you put someone at risk by building a house with hidden risks and the house collapses, it was your fault and you need to own some of that risk. The incentive design here clearly keeps you away from hiding risks in the house by cutting corners. Incentive design is the most important factor to understand how people act and interact. Bad incentive design leads to the principal-agent problem, where you separate the labor from the fruits of labor. A principal is an owner and an agent is someone working for the owner. Either Julius Caesar or Napoleon once said that if you want it done, then go, else send. It's such a simple statement, but it carries a lot of information about how we act. If you want something done right, you need to do it yourself, because you are the only one with skin in the game. If your agents are not exposed to the same potential upside, they simply don't care enough. And this phenomenon manifests itself in different scenarios. Let's look at a few of them. Transactions, for example. A vendor in a one-shot transaction does not have his interests aligned with yours, and so can hide stuff from you. And that's why no person in a transaction should have certainty about the outcome, while the other one has uncertainty. This transaction symmetry is very important to look at on different societal levels. Groups behave very different than individuals. Just as understanding how a neuron works doesn't really tell you how a brain works, understanding how a human works does not tell you how a group of humans work. You can think of this yourself. In a big city, for example, you have a degree of anonymity that you don't have in a small village where everyone knows each other. You actually behave differently in these scenarios. What Ostrom found empirically is that there exists a certain community size below which people act as collectivists, protecting the commons, as if the entire unit became rational. Such a commons cannot be too large. I, I think the, really socialism comes from the heart, right? You all, we all want to be socialist. Capitalism comes from the head because there are always cheaters in any system. Yes. And there's incentives in any system. So. When you're young, if you're, if, if you're not a socialist, you have no heart. When you're older, if you're not a capitalist, you have no head, right? right? You haven't thought it through. So I understand where it comes from. I always liked Nassim Taleb's framing on this, where he said, with my family, I'm a communist. Mm. With my close friends, I'm a socialist. Uh, you know, at my state level politics, I'm a Democrat. At you know, higher levels, I'm a, I'm a Republican. And at the federal level, I'm a libertarian, mm. right? So basically, the larger the group of people you have massed together who have different interests, the less trust there is, the more cheating there is, the better the incentives have to be aligned, the better the system has to work, the more you go towards capitalism. The smaller the group you're in, you're in a kibbutz, you're in your commune, you're in your house, you're in your tribe, by all means, be a socialist with my aunts, with my brother, with my cousins, with my uncles, with my mom, with yes. my family. I'm a socialist. That's the right way to live a loving, happy, integrated life. Yes. But when you're dealing with strangers, I mean, you want to be a real socialist? Great. Open all your doors and windows tomorrow. Please, yeah. everybody, come take what you want. <laughs> See how that works out. Historically, leaders were always the ones who are exposed to the consequences of the risks they took the most compared to the common people. What this translates to is this. Less than a third of Roman emperors died in their beds. Today, on the other hand, leaders are the most overprotected ones, sitting in their comfy armchair and just directing the people who are exposed to the consequences of the risks the leader took. 
The lack of skin in the game turns society into a overcomplicated, fragile composition of bullshitters. Bureaucracy is a construction by which a person is conveniently separated from the consequences of his or her actions. A problem with no skin in the game bureaucracy is that you are rewarded for complicated solutions instead of the results that the solutions deliver. Things designed by people without skin in the game tend to grow in complication before their final collapse. There is absolutely no benefit for someone in such a position to propose something simple. When you are rewarded for perception, not results, you need to show sophistication. But evolution can only happen if risk of extinction is present. Further, there is no evolution without skin in the game. So what people resent or should resent is the person at the top who has no skin in the game. That is because he doesn't bear his allotted risk. He is immune to the possibility of falling from his pedestal, exiting his income or wealth bracket and waiting in line outside the soup kitchen. Let's go one step further and look at academia. The deciding differentiator between a scientist and a business operator is who their actions are judged by. A scientist is judged by other scientists in so-called peer reviews. A business operator is judged by his customers. Academia has a tendency, when unchecked from lack of skin in the game, to evolve into a ritualistic, self-referential publishing game. Restaurant owners, on the other hand, worry about the opinion of their customers, not those of other restaurant owners. They are judged by reality and their P&L. Now, why is that so important? And businesses where you're judged by reality, by your P&L, by your accountant. The only person you want to impress at the end of the day is your accountant. Now, true, you don't want to be hated by your peers, but it's not, they're not the ones whose approval you need to seek. Now, academia, it's a business where people are entirely judged by peers. Entirely. This is what causes all the problems we have. Bureaucrats. Who judges bureaucrats? Other bureaucrats. The boss. This, this, this. It doesn't work. They start to have meetings, you see. And when a firm becomes very large, you, start, you cannot associate the P&L attributed directly to a certain person they start having meetings, look busy, fly to uh, Omaha, come back, fly, you know, do things, you know, talk to you on the phone for two hours, uh, uh, write long emails, uh, stuff like that. That's the problem. Yeah, we see this in the tech industry too. There's a lot of tracking of inputs instead of tracking outputs. Exactly. A great so. engineer can create a billion dollars worth of value, look at Satoshi Nakamoto, and a bad engineer can cost you value. It has nothing to do with the amount of time they put in. Yet there are still managers who want the engineers in at 8 a.m. They want them working 40, 50 hour weeks and it's just complete nonsense. So what should you do? How can you have skin in the game to make the world a better place? When young people who want to help mankind come to me asking what should I do, I want to reduce poverty, save the world and similar noble aspirations at the macro level, my suggestion is 1. Never engage in virtual signaling, 2. Never engage in rent seeking and 3. You must start a business. Put yourself on the line, start a business. Risk takers who own their risk are the people who drive humanity forward. The second one, something I addressed in Skin in the Game, is that people are still unable to uh, uh, realize that uh, there should be no risk management. You should study risk taking, not risk management, because you cannot separate uh, the income generating technique from the risks associated with it. They're not separable. It's the same, it's a decision making. And they all should be in a class of decision making on uncertainty. So you should attract more risk takers. And in fact, I see some risk takers, but I'm saying that you have to worry about an industry that's dominated by non risk takers discussing risks and separating the function from that of risk taking. To be clear, there is a class of risks that you should never take. If you can go bust and never recover from a risk that you take, you should never take that risk no matter how big the upside is. One may be risk-loving, yet completely averse to ruin. In a strategy that entails ruin, benefits never offset risks of ruin. Every single risk you take adds up to reduce your life expectancy. Rationality is avoidance of systemic ruin. This is also why the phenomenon of loss aversion is not as stupid as some psychologists say it is. To be able to play the game, you need to still be in the game. If you are ruined, you are not part of the game anymore. The first priority, therefore, is always survival. That's it for this video and the conclusion to the Insider series. If you enjoyed the video or learned something from it, I would appreciate it if you leave a like and subscribe to the channel for further content. I have many other books and ideas that I want to cover in the future, so thank you for watching and I will see you next time.